Well, hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, welcome to our live conversation, Dealing with Historic Changes and Challenges in the Middle East, hosted by B'nai B'rith International and the Achim Gate City Lodge in Atlanta. Hello, everyone. I'm Helen Shear Diamond, president of Achim Gate City Lodge here in Atlanta. Thank you all for joining us today. We want to welcome you to a timely conversation that I have the honor of hosting with these two very impressive guests on behalf of our lodge and B'nai B'rith International. Very briefly, if you have any questions, we would like you to ask the speakers by submitting them via the Q&A function on your screen. I am pleased to introduce Mr. Daniel S. Mariushin, CEO of Benabrith International. As CEO, Mr. Mariushin directs and supervises Benabrith programs, activities, and staff in countries around the world where Benabrith is organized. He also serves as director of Benabrith Center for Human Rights and public policy, where he presents B'nai B'rith's perspective to a variety of audience, including Congress and the media, and coordinates the center's programs and policies on issues of concern to the Jewish community. Mr. Mary Ashen will be interviewing Deputy Consul General of Israel to the Southeastern United States, based here in Atlanta, Georgia, Mr. Alex Gundler um, about the evolving dynamics in the Middle East and how these shifts impact Israel. Mr. Gundler is stepping in today for Consul General Anat Sultan Dadon, who has been called out of town. Alex Gundler assumed his role as a deputy Consul General of Israel to Southeastern United States in August 2019. Deputy Consul General Gondler has served as the press attache at the Israeli Embassy in Moscow, Russia. Prior to joining the Israeli Foreign Service, he worked in the Knesset as a legislative assistant and spokesperson. Mr. Mariashin and Deputy Consul General Gandler, thank you both for being here today. We appreciate the time you have devoted to this and all your work to the Jewish community. Thank you, Helen. Thanks for having us here today. Thank you. I'll now turn things over to Mr. Mariashin, who will speak with Mr. Gandler about the changing dynamics in the Middle East and his work in the southeastern United States at the Israeli consulate here in Atlanta. Well, thank you, Helen. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, Deputy Consul General Gandler, thank you so much for stepping in and joining us today. And uh, I'd like to uh, jump right into things with a question that's on everybody's mind, and it's not necessarily a Middle East issue, it's a global issue, and that's COVID-19. Israel really has established a standard uh, for how a rollout of vaccines is, uh, is to be done. Uh, tell us about that and tell us about Israel's success in that regard. Well, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Um, Israel's success um, regarding COVID-19 and the vaccination process is going on in Israel at the moment uh, is regarded a world success and Israel is the first country to uh, have such a wide vaccination of its population. And uh, to be honest, it started in Israel because of uh, three things. Uh, one is our uh, very robust and uh, free healthcare system, which also uh, saves data. Uh, um, our relative small population and agreements reached by Israel with uh, Pfizer and Moderna regarding vaccinations. Um, just yesterday or two days ago, I saw that uh, the city where I come from in Israel, Jerusalem, uh, put out mobile vaccination sites in the Machna Yehuda market, which is the last place I lived in before moving to Russia and then to the United States. 
Uh, so uh, just by putting it as close as, a, uh, as possible to where you live or where you go to shop or uh, um, wherever is more convenient to the person, um, together with a very uh, wide campaign for vaccination uh, in the media and through governmental bodies for all Israeli citizens and residents alike. And what do you see uh, going forward now? This is, uh, as I understand it, about um, is it 30 or 35 percent of the total population has been vaccinated. And of course, in the high risk categories, uh, very early on, almost everyone uh, who, who sought to have a vaccination got one. Um, what's the plan for the, the remainder of, of the population? How does that work? It's a challenge, and I think it's a challenge that the world looks in is, at Israel and understand that it's going to uh, uh, deal with as well when the time comes. Uh, it's a PR challenge more than anything. Uh, pe young people or people who are already six, sick or uh, even skeptics of vaccinations are presenting a challenge towards full uh, vaccination of the, of the population. And that is why we have a very big and very... Uh, well-funded campaign in Israel regarding uh, the vaccinations to try and attract as much uh, of the young population as possible. I've heard of bars offering shots uh, and free beers uh, for people who will come to be vaccinated in the bar. Um, the same thing with supermarkets and other facilities. And as I said earlier about the Machne the market, uh, which if, if you've been to uh, Jerusalem for the past 10 years has become uh, quite a young scene. Uh, I think the challenge is definitely with the younger population, uh, 20 to 30s, uh, 30s to 40s, uh, who feel that they don't need to be vaccinated because the symptoms that they will experience will be lighter than the ones in uh, uh, other groups. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. And uh, it's a mistake that the government is trying to explain to the citizens, um, even if you don't get sick, even if you are asymptomatic, what will happen is you will spread the disease and you will be uh, responsible for the well-being of your family and loved ones around you. There was a story just a few days ago. It's a heartbreaking story. And to be honest, I'm not sure of all the details. Um, a young woman, a mother of four, uh, early 30s, uh, pregnant, uh, became ill because she was infected by one of her family members and unfortunately she died. Her cousin came on Israeli national TV uh, and gave an interview saying that he was wrong. He was one of the first Israelis to, oh, so he claims, to open up Facebook group, uh, Facebook group against vaccinations in Israel. Uh, which promoted anti-vaccinations and had thousands of followers. He said that he stopped the group uh, or paused the group's activity now after his cousin died because he understands that you need to be vaccinated and called everyone to vaccinate. That was a tragic story. Indeed. Uh, let's move uh, to um, an area, another area, uh, your area, your neighborhood, uh, the Middle East, and uh, talk about the significance of the recent normalization agreements, the peace agreements uh, with uh, the UAE and Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco. Um, 2020, in, in that regard, was a, was a very positive year uh, for those who have been working so long to bring about uh, this kind of normalization. Um, talk a little in, in broad terms, we can get into specifics too, about these agreements and the ramifications for Israel and for the broader Middle East. You're absolutely right saying the broader Middle East, uh, or even the world, uh, to be exact. Uh, these agreements are something um, to look up to and uh, expect uh, more agreements of that kind to be signed. Um, there is so much uh, to gain on all sides from these agreements. Um, just a few days ago, two or three days ago, a new ambassador uh, was sworn in in the UAE to serve as its first ambassador in Israel, His Excellence Mohammed Mahmoud al Haja, uh, which already opened the Twitter account both in Arabic and in Hebrew and gained uh, tens of thousands of Israelis uh, to, uh, to follow him. 
which is an ama amazing. He was surprised at himself. He wrote it on uh, Twitter about it, how surprised he was for uh, the love received from the Israeli people. Um, a few days ago, the Egyptian minister of oil visited uh, Israel. Now, th there is a slight difference between the peace agreement that, uh, or the agreements that were signed with the UAE uh, and the ones that are signed with Egypt. The UAE is a country we were never in war with. Uh, Egypt was in 1977 when the agreements were signed. Uh, I'm sorry, 1979 when the agreement was signed. Um, uh, uh, the the peace with Egypt was um, characterized as a cold peace or a colder peace that we wanted to between the countries, especially on uh, the day to day level and the civilian level uh, and the trade level for for that extent as well. And the peace with the UAE seems a bit warmer, but I think it affects a lot of the countries around us. That visit by the Minister of Oil for Egypt a few days ago is the first visit since two thousand and sixteen by such a high level ranking Egyptian uh, minister or personality. Um, he, was, uh, uh, he was pictured on uh, Leviathan, the Israeli gas platform uh, in front of our beaches with an Egyptian and an Israeli flag. Uh, he met with uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Gabi Ashkenazi, uh, and were pictured together talking. Uh, it feels like there's something is becoming warmer in the Middle East and in a very good sense and not in a, a, a bad sense. Uh, so these agreements, as you said, with the UAE, uh, with Morocco, I know that uh, delegations from uh, Israel will be traveling to Morocco very soon to work out more details about their peace agreement, um, are promoting peace across the Middle East. Uh, and I think it broke a paradigm that was uh, part of everyone's life uh, in the last several decades that uh, uh, Arab nations cannot maintain peace with Israel uh, without solving uh, the Palestinian issue. And we understand that the Palestinian issue is a separate issue. Uh, and Israel can make peace with Arab countries and is striving uh, very seriously to have that peace, maintain that peace, and make it a warm peace. Um, just today, uh, I read that uh, El Ayan, uh, an Arab, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a UAE soccer team is going to play Maccabi Haifa. I'm sorry, I'm a soccer fan. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I, to be honest, I, I'm a Beitar Jerusalem fan more than a Maccabi Haifa fan, but I am so happy to see that the peace reaches such levels where you'll be able to see Israel play Middle Eastern teams something that didn't happen before. I think the last games against Middle Eastern teams uh, were probably Maccabi Tel Aviv somewhere in the Asia Cup in the 70s, maybe. Uh, but before that, we're talking about mandatory Palestine. And we have those posters of the mandatory Palestine and brackets AI, Eretz Israel, uh, playing against uh, the Cairo British Mandate soccer team. Uh, those dreams are becoming realities, um, something that every Israeli strives for. It makes our life so much happier uh, to be able to travel uh, from Israel uh, to the UAE. It's the first time I think that Israelis look at traveling eastwards to the close east, um, flying over Saudi Arabia. Even a year ago, I think it would have been a, a dream. Alex, let me let me ask you this, because, you know, we of course, we look first and foremost at the uh, strategic uh, implications of all of this, extremely important, because when you're talking about peace, uh, you have to talk about what the strategic uh, uh, imperatives are here. But once we get COVID behind us, I mean, we already saw, we had a, a little bit of a taste in terms of Israeli tourists going to the UAE. But of course, there's much more than that. There's There are, there are joint investment opportunities um, that certainly um, will uh, advance the economies of, of both countries. In the case of Morocco, uh, you've got that large uh, uh, Israeli sector of the Israeli population, which uh, uh, has its roots in Morocco. So you have those ties, very iconic Jewish community in Morocco. So post-COVID, if you look, again, beyond the, the other issues, which are, we're going to talk about a little bit more in a second, um, what are the possibilities here? They're endless, it seems. It is endless, and I, I was looking at stats today towards this meeting to be 
on point and uh, uh, as much uh, um, accurate as I can. And I understood that the trade between Israel and the UAE, just the UAE, uh, since um, the, the Abraham Accords has been $1 billion. We didn't have any trade with the UAE before that. And in these few months, it's $1 billion. I was speaking to a friend of mine who uh, works in New York. Um, he's in the private sector. And we were talking about business opportunities that can be achieved both in Israel and the UAE and how to connect that. And he said, you know what? I can actually have like a long weekend in Israel and the UAE. Look at companies in Israel, go and find a financier in the UAE or exactly the opposite. Um, and businessmen from both the United States and Europe can now have day trips to the Middle East to, uh, uh, to find company, fund them. It's a big and huge boost to economies uh, across the Middle East. And I think both countries saw that coming into this agreement. So one more question on normalization. Uh, what, do you, what do you foresee? I mean, we've heard, uh, I, I won't ask you for specific countries because we don't know exactly where, where this is going, but would you uh, expect, and certainly we hope, but would you expect in 2021 that this uh, circle of normalization will expand and uh, we're talking not only about your immediate neighbors, but also perhaps elsewhere in the Islamic world. Uh, what, do you, what do you see ahead? Um, I think that the focus now for uh, a lot of countries would be to take care of COVID first. Uh, to be honest, I really hope that this continues and there are Islamic countries that are not in the Middle East or not near us um, that could be a, a potential um, or could be the next potential uh, um, um, partner for an agreement. Even a, a very close allies. I know that in the media people spoke about Saudi Arabia uh, for some time. Um, these things uh, do take time, a bit more time. Um, I think that a lot of the focus at the moment is on COVID. If we see any more surprises, uh, you, you can never know. Uh, even these accords were huge surprises uh, to a lot of people. Uh, they came out of nowhere, and I think that that's one of the problem. Uh, some people are having a hard time uh, understanding what exactly happened because of the surprise, because of, oh, wait, what do you mean? Why didn't this happen before? Uh, why is it suddenly happening now? Uh, and it was just good opportunities. We also saw Israel uh, having new agreements with countries in Europe, Kosovo, for an example, uh, who are going to establish an embassy in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, more and more embassies are moving to Israel's capital. Um, it's, it's not a new thing. Ca uh, most uh, embassies were in Jerusalem and uh, were moved to Tel Aviv uh, after the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Uh, so they're actually coming back. Most countries are going to come back to our nation's capital. Uh, hopefully so we saw, we'll see that coming on. Yes. Yeah, we saw no, like, just in the last few days that uh, Equatorial Guinea uh, has yes. announced that it will move its, its embassy to Jerusalem. So the, uh, the year is off uh, to a good start. And of mm -hmm. course, uh, you're right. When COVID gets behind us, we look uh, for much more. Let's talk about uh, the, the threat uh, to, to peace and stability. We've talked about normalization, which uh, we hope will expand the, the, the area of stability. Uh, but let's talk about Iran, which poses the biggest uh, threat uh, to the region. Its drive for nuclear weapons, uh, its hegemonism in the region, in Iraq, in Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, its um, connection to uh, Hezbollah, of course, um, not to mention its ties with, with Hamas on, on your south. Um, but we're talking about a country that's a threat to the region. Of course, Israel is every day um, uh, a, 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 a rhetorical target for the Iranians, uh, threatening uh, uh, one day uh, uh, that it's going to uh, wipe out Haifa and Tel Aviv, the next day that Israel is a, a cancer that has to be removed uh, from the region. But other countries are affected as well in the region. Uh, let's talk about that. How, how do you think 2021 will play out in terms of that Iranian threat? 
Well, it's a, it's a good connection, what you just did. A, a great connection between what's going to come along, uh, what peace agreements, peace accords will come along, and what is the threat. Um, Iran, Iran is a very bad actor in the international arena. Um, its arms are uh, connected to terror and are funding terror. A lot of Iranian money is going to terror, by the way, in, in the Middle East, in our region, but also uh, in the United States region as well. Uh, uh, South America, uh, the Triangle of Borders uh, is filled with Iranian money funding drug trade and weapons. Um, uh, Iran is trying to be uh, a major world player. It is now uh, a major um, air, uh, area player in the Middle East, um, and it's trying uh, to be more effective on the international arena, obviously trying to do so by developing nuclear weapons uh, and uh, uh, gaining pressure by that on other, other players or countries uh, that are involved in the international arena. We can see that all countries that Iran is involved in are countries that are suffering. Uh, you've mentioned Lebanon, which is having a terrible year, uh, both with the explosion, which was uh, mostly uh, a symbol of the decayness of its uh, economy and political system. Yemen, which has been at war for several years now and is not, not going anywhere. Uh, and other countries across the region, Whoever can um, uh, uh, escape that grasp of Iran is trying to do so. Uh, countries that we had peace accords with are definitely trying to get away from Iran, who sits just across the Gulf with uh, the UAE. Um, it, it's a bad actor. It's a bad actor. And I think the international arena in a whole understands it. And Israel and its uh, both allies and neighbors I have a lot of the same interest in keeping Iran away from those nuclear weapons. Yeah, well, the objective is, is that and also its uh, malign behavior um, in the region, wherever it goes, it, it creates chaos. And uh, uh, certainly it's going to be uh, no question in terms of uh, the strategic dimension of the region. It's going to be topic A, uh, I'm sure, uh, in the year to come. I want to switch the focus to uh, an issue um, that um, all of us are deeply concerned about, uh, the boycott, divestment, sanctions, the BDS movement in this country. It started out on college and university campuses, but now we, you know, we see it everywhere. Um, uh, how does the, the consulate get involved in combating BDS and anti-Semitism on the campus? Um, and how do you view this particular issue uh, from both a, a Jewish and a diplomatic perspective. I wonder what I want to take on first, uh, my Jewish identity or my diplomatic uh, position. Um, first of all, the consulate um, is in charge in this region on, uh, on seven states. We sit in Atlanta, Georgia, but we also have North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, and Mississippi. Um, the way we go about it, uh, about combating BDS and anti-Semitism, uh, which is, uh, if not the same thing, very closely aligned, um, uh, is by reaching out to civil society, uh, both Jewish and, of course, non-Jewish civil society. Uh, on campus, we try and um, promote the campus and uh, the leaders of the campus, both from the students and the management, to be proactive against BDS and against anti-Semitism. If it hasn't happened on your campus, it might happen on your campus. Uh, remember what happened in, at Emory and at UGA here in Atlanta and in Georgia, uh, but in other campuses as well, uh, both in North Carolina and uh, others across uh, the nation. Um, we try and tell whenever we meet with uh, with deans or provosts, uh, listen, it hasn't happened yet, but it will, and probably will. You want to be the one that says, I prevented it first. I was there, and I um, adopted the IRA definition, for an example, because I now I know what anti-Semitism is. I defined it. And if you go against it, there will be consequences, uh, and the students would know that. 
Um, we talk, that, that is an example for what we do on campuses, but we talk to civil society as a whole, uh, leaders in uh, uh, different groups of society. Um, uh, here in Atlanta, Georgia, we have uh, a big part of uh, the city and the state is the African-American community. And uh, we try and engage them as much as we can. Unfortunately, for the past year, we're living under COVID conditions. Uh, prior to that, we had events at Morehouse uh, commemorating uh, and trying to show what Israel is and what the connection with the Jewish people is. Um, uh, one of the events we had was the remembrance of uh, uh, the Day of Remembrance for refugees from Arab and Muslim countries, uh, something that most people don't know and don't understand. What do you mean Jewish refugees from Arab countries? And yes, that, that was something that happened uh, when the state of Israel was born, when Arab countries kicked out their Jews and made pogroms in uh, different cities across the Middle East. And we try and show it to people who don't know about it uh, and get only one part of the agenda uh, from the Palestinian side. Um, so uh, now, obviously, as you said, as you asked, what do we do? It's mostly webinars, uh, to be honest, mostly webinars about connections uh, uh, between uh, Jews and the African-Americans uh, and uh, the civil rights movement. Uh, that's part of it. Um, uh, well, it's so important to really to, to fight BDS as anti-Semitism. I think the, um, the, the idea that, which is what the BDS movement really is about uh, to um, uh, separate out, to marginalize Israel, to demonize, to delegitimize Israel, to hold it to a different standard. And when you call it an apartheid state and when you, when you make, do all of, these, all of these things, what you're doing is you're treating Israel to a separate standard. And when, you, when you're doing that, you're engaging in anti-Semitism. And it's, it's so important, of course, even though now the movement can be found in, in many different places, but um, when we're talking about a college campus, we're talking about the next generation. Yes. The importance of young people. And uh, that's why, which, which you've said about, first of all, introducing the IRA definition, which is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition. The IRA, it's called IRA. IRA is an organization of countries uh, that uh, promotes uh, Holocaust remembrance research and education. So they've come up with a definition. That's extremely important. And now I understand a lot of um, university, uh, college, uh, student councils, um, universities themselves are beginning to look at the definition and, and to adopt it, which, which is extremely important because that is the baseline. That's the, that's the definition. And from exactly. there, and from there, then you bring in what, you, what you've said, which is to educate about all that Israel is. And we just talked about you know, the COVID rollout, but we could talk about Israel as a startup nation and, and, and driverless cars and, <laughs> and the, that, that pill that you take, which has the little camera, which, which helps in uh, you know, gastroenterology. I mean, all of these things um, follow on, which of course are, are extremely- Water, the desert, uh, the turn to Africa. There's, there's so much to talk about. Um, when I was in Russia, we decided to show uh, Russian international students, I'm sorry, Russian students in the international school, uh, how Israel turned to Africa in the uh, 1970s. And we did a presentation uh, um, about Golda Meir. And we came to Mgimo, which is the, the Harvard or the Yale of Russia, and we showed them who Golda Meir was and what she did and how Israel contributed to Africa and continues to contribute through uh, Mashav, which is the Israel, uh, the USAID of Israel, the development arm of the Israeli Foreign Service. There is so much to talk about, uh, about Israel and so much uh, to show other people. And Ira does exactly, as you said, give a baseline, but not only a baseline, a proactive baseline. And it's so important not to react, but actually to make the first move and to come to the campus and talk to uh, both student leaders, but also to the provost and to the president and say, listen, let's make a move. Let's adopt this. Let's look at this. We're going to give it to you. And our job is, of course, to uh, bring it on al Magash al Kesef, you would say in Hebrew, on a platter of silver to those people and show them how to do it. 
let's go beyond the campus for uh, for a moment. What's some of the current work uh, that you're doing at the consulate to combat anti-Semitism beyond the, the campus? So as I said, uh, the our return, as Golda's turn to Africa was, um, you know, it's a, our turn is to civil society. Our turn is to talk to the leaders of the civil society um, across the nation, both the, our consulate, but all consulates and uh, the embassy here in the United States. We have nine and all uh, are uh, talking about the subject and it's one of our main subjects uh, to talk about. Uh, in all aspects. So every consulate you will see has a small distinction. Uh, the consulate in Boston focuses a lot of ca on campuses and education. The one in New York, it's, by the way, the biggest Israeli mission in the world, um, focuses a lot of on Jewish organizations, uh, Hispanic, um, Hispanic community. Uh, San Francisco, uh, of course, a lot of tech industry, uh, uh, also the LGBTQ plus community, um, Los Angeles on the movie industry. Every consulate has, like every city actually, it takes the characteristics of that city and that region. Atlanta, we're fortunate to be in a, a very important region of the United States that is so well connected to the civil rights movement. Uh, just now I'm sitting in front of you uh, uh, because the Consul General is with the ambassador uh, in Alabama, uh, having a tour regarding uh, um, the civil rights movement uh, and Black History Month. Uh, we give a lot of focus on that. Obviously, uh, we focus a lot of on Jewish community, um, but regarding uh, combating anti-Semitism, uh, we are always we're always talking about it with whoever we meet. Uh, if it's the governors and uh, the ambassador, the consul general have met with the governor of South Carolina two days ago. Uh, and today and today they're meeting with the governor of Alabama. Uh, they'll probably mention it in the, in the speech. What is happening about combating anti-Semitism here in Alabama? Uh, what is happening when we speak to the mayor or the governor of, uh, of Georgia uh, the mayor of Atlanta, we speak about what is happening with anti-Semitism here in Atlanta. We look at cases and we follow every time there is a swastika on a door, uh, a pamphlet on a student campus, um, uh, something said to someone somewhere, uh, we, keep, uh, we keep an eye out uh, and uh, we work with the Jewish community to fight anti-Semitism and with the civic community uh, uh, to be proactive uh, and to teach what anti-Semitism is. A great example was a few days ago on SNL, Saturday Night Live, with its uh, very grave remark regarding uh, Jews uh, giving vaccinations to Jews alone. Um, coming from the Soviet Union, and that's where I was born, um, it, it sounded, it had, it had a very particular sound of uh, Jews taking only care of themselves. Um, luckily, it's very easy to explain. Uh, no, actually everyone in Israel is getting uh, the vaccination, even undocumented people. Let's talk about uh, a, um, a, an issue, it's not an issue actually, let's talk about something that uh, is near and dear to our hearts, uh, and that's the Israel diaspora relationship, extremely important uh, from day one, um, and um, and before day one, if you if you go even back before 1948, extremely Absolutely. important. Absolutely. Uh, and you're sitting now. You're sitting in Atlanta. Uh, your office covers seven uh, southeastern states. Uh, what importance does Israel? place on the relationship with the diaspora. And, and, and you in particular, seeing it from your perspective now, you're not sitting in Jerusalem, you're sitting in Atlanta. So how do you see it from here? Uh, first of all, the United States, when you look at it as a whole, it's it's not a country, it's a, it's a continent. Uh, but even in the biggest countries, and as I said, I was in Russia prior to coming to the United States, Russia is the biggest country in the world that has 
uh, if I'm not mistaken, nine time zones. Uh, you get jet lag to fly from uh, um, even from Novos Novosibirsk to to Moscow or from Kamchatka. You will Kamchatka is actually I think it's closer to Atlanta to, than to Moscow, and it's exactly on the other side. Um, and in Russia, we have two consulates. Uh, or I'm sorry, an embassy and a consulate. The embassy is in Moscow, the consulate is in St. Petersburg. Uh, most of Israeli missions are directed not for Israeli citizens per se, even though we do give consular services, um, but it's actually uh, to represent Israel and to engage uh, people who live uh, and are foreign citizens in the country that the consulate or the foreign mission is at. Um, the fact that we have uh, nine missions here in the United States alone, three more in Canada, by the way, um, just gives you an example of the importance we see speaking to diaspora here in the United States. Uh, the diaspora here in the United States, as, and as you said, um, before day one, definitely before day one, way before day one, uh, was so important and crucial to the continuum of uh, Jewish people of the Jewish people, I'm not even speaking about the state of Israel. Um, and the state of Israel looks at the di diaspora uh, as, uh, you know, as a base for Jews, one, but also as uh, an unbreakable and continuable contact. Um, it is extremely important for us to maintain that relationship as one of our uh, main goals and also basic goals. Uh, there are things you can put on top of what we do here, but one of the basic things we do, and I think the first people we spoke to here, uh, when both me and the Consul General came to the United States and we came uh, about the same time, uh, was to speak to the Jewish leaders in our area uh, and to understand uh, what is on their table, uh, what are the issues they are facing, uh, how big is their congregation, uh, how um, how how has it been going for the last uh, few years? Uh, the Jewish diaspora, both here in the United States, and I'm speaking of, as someone who sits here in Atlanta, of course, but I can speak as a whole about all the Jewish diaspora in the world, also uh, in Russia and Europe, um, is extremely important to the state of Israel. Um, yes. Well, you anticipated you anticipated my next question, which was. How does the consulate work with organizations like B'nai B'rith uh, that, that advocate tirelessly on behalf of the state of Israel and Jews around the world and remain dedicated to improving the quality of life for people around the globe? And I think, uh, I think you've answered that, that we do work together uh, to bring about not only the close relations between Israel and, uh, and the diaspora, but also to, to advance, um, again, all of the all of the good things that are that are coming out of Israel that you've talked about, all of all of the the advancements in medicine and technology, and agriculture, um, uh, you name it, and um, that partnership, of course, is uh, is extremely important for for historical reasons, for for uh, uh, religious reasons, and the Jewish community, and and also for reasons of the present, uh, where we work together on on so many important things. At this point, I, I think I'd like to turn it back to uh, Helen Shera Diamond uh, to see if there are some questions uh, that the audience may have posed. Helen? Thank you, gentlemen. We definitely had a great question. We wanted to know from one of the audience attendees she misses her regular trips to Israel, and she's had both the COVID-19 injections. She wanted to ask when she'll be able to go back to Israel to visit her family. Well, first of all, would, we would be happy for her to come to Israel. I think everyone in Israel misses people coming, uh, their family. A lot of people have family abroad. My, my family, uh, uh, a lot of it is here in the New York area. So I know they wanna come and visit my mom who's now in Israel and uh, wants to see the family as well. Um, at the moment, unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic, uh, international travel is very limited. Um, Israel is trying uh, very hard uh, via vaccination and vaccinating its uh, population uh, to allow uh, 
international travel to come back. We have several agreements in the, in the pipeline with closer nations, um, uh, Cyprus, Italy, uh, Greece, but they're still in the pipeline. Uh, it's something called the Green Passport. It hasn't uh, started yet. Um, you should all remember that there is a problem uh, also understanding who got vaccinated by what, when, uh, how, the vaccinations, there, are, there aren't any international agreements regarding vaccinations. Israeli vaccinations um, are not known here in the U.S., uh, United, uh, in Israel, everyone is in one system. As I said, the first thing I said about the vaccinations in Israel is that we have one system, all uh, the medical, local medical centers are connected into one system that is connected to the Ministry of Health. Everyone is part of that system, and thus we have everyone's information uh, regarding did they get vaccinated, when was it, uh, side effects. We have all the data, but that data does not transfer to the U.S., uh, so uh, there aren't any agreements yet about who was vaccinated and who wasn't. Uh, and there is a lot of um, um, uh, worry uh, about uh, transmitting new variants of the disease. Uh, that's why um, international travel in, as a whole, even in Israel, Israel at the moment by uh, a governmental uh, decision by the Prime Minister's office and the Ministry of Transportation has closed its border to only 200 Israelis coming in every day. So even Israelis are stuck abroad. And uh, I get, I am the head of the consular section uh, here at the consulate. Um, I, uh, I'm i getting requests from Israelis who say, well, I live in Israel. My center of life is in Israel. I would like to go home. Um, and I, they, they can't. Uh, because of the government policy. I want to be optimistic, and I want to say this summer. I, I really do. Um, but, but I can't make any promises. And I actually have inside information because my wife uh, is the director of uh, uh, the Ministry of Tourism here in the South. Um, that is the reason, by the way, why I'm here in Atlanta. We decided after two years apart uh, to come together. Um, but uh, if, when I ask her, listen, what, what are the plans of your office of the Ministry of Tourism for accepting tourists? When is the date? And she says, well, listen, um, we're still working on it. We're still thinking. We're working with the Ministry of Transportation and the Ministry of Health to understand how to do it. After, Thank you, Mr. Gunn. Yes. I'm sorry. No, no good news. Not yet. We have another question from the audience. They're concerned what more could be said about the threat of Iran to Israel and the Middle East? Well, I said that Iran is uh, a, a terrible actor. And uh, Daniel, um, we reiterated and um, expanded on the, uh, on the, on the poor, I'm looking for the right word. I have it in Hebrew and in Russian, but I'm looking for it in English. Uh, uh, maleficent, I'm, I'm not sure I'm making it correctly, but uh, actions of Iran in the region. Um, Iran is trying to pressure the international community via developing nuclear weapons or a nuclear capability uh, to, uh, to influence the international community uh, and to influence other countries. Now, Iran, while it's uh, developing these nuclear capabilities, it's also developing a missile capability. Um, and those missiles can reach, uh, now they can reach Israel and they can reach uh, all the way to Central Europe and eventually they'll be able to reach uh, the Western part of Europe and the British Isles. Um, and it will make Iran a, a major actor in the world and a very bad actor. Uh, it funds terrorist organizations, drug trade, uh, uh, um, dictators around the globe, not only in our region. Um, and eventually, um, if we will not stop Iran from developing those nuclear weapons, that bad actor uh, will have a leverage 
on other countries. Um, they're trying uh, to make their place in the world in a very uh, maleficent way. Um, so the importance, and I think most of our allies agree that Iran should not have those capabilities, not to be able to pressure uh, uh, the world into submitting to uh, its ill-mannered uh, actions. Um, we, sh we can't trust a country that finds suicide bombers and children who run on, uh, on mines. Uh, I'm, I'm referring to the Iran-Iraq war, by the way. Uh, if you haven't heard of that, I, I suggest you read a, a bit about it and understand what this Iranian government is that is led by uh, extremist clerics um, who uh, uh, deal with uh, a philosophy uh, that prefers death to life uh, and is nowhere close to uh, democracy or even the side of democracy. Thank you, Mr. Gundler. We have one last question that leads right to that. Do you think the Biden administration will reverse to the former paradigm that there can't be peace without solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? I don't want to comment or give predictions about what the Biden administration will or will not do. Uh, the relationship between President Biden and the state of Israel was always warm. Uh, for many, many years, President Biden has expressed um, um, a lot of warmth towards the state of Israel, and we're very happy uh, to work with uh, the American administration, as we always have. Um, uh, the relationships on all levels have always been good and continue to be good. Uh, my counterparts in Washington and in Jerusalem talk to their counterparts in Washington and in Jerusalem. Uh, the conversation between Israel and the United States is, um, is very friendly. Uh, the United States is, is our biggest strategic ally and partner. Uh, and uh, uh, the United States sees Israel in the same way. Um, as regards to the Palestinians uh, and peace agreement, um, Israel has called the Palestinians uh, many times to the, to the peace table for an agreement to recognize Israel as the Jewish state, as the home of the Jewish people, and uh, to go ahead and have a peace agreement. Uh, the Palestinians have rejected it uh, numerous times, and we still call them to the table. We're not giving up. We're not giving up on them, even though they might have given up on us. Uh, uh, for some reason or the other, but we're here to set an example and show them that peace can be warm and good and uh, soccer teams can play each other. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous when I'm, I'm, I'm from Jerusalem. I'm from Northern Jerusalem. I'm from the French Hill, which uh, if people were in uh, Jerusalem and know, is surrounded by Arab villages. It's not very far from Ramallah. Um, when I grew up in a different neighborhood, in Neve Yaakov, um, for Lag Baomer, I used to go and collect trees uh, next to Bitunia. It was just across the valley. I would go down the valley, go into Ramallah to Bitunia, one of its neighborhoods, and collect trees. We're so close um, that it's uh, in a way ridiculous, um, but we can have peace agreements with by the way, if anyone thought it, it's a problem between Judaism and Islam, it is not. That is not the problem, and it, it, it has never been. Uh, we are so, ex I cannot express, I try to all the time, but I, I, I still can't find the, a good way to do it, express the joyfulness we have as Israelis to have peace agreement with, uh, the, with the UAE and with Morocco and with any other country that will make peace with us uh, in our region. Israelis flocked the UAE as tourists. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn this over to Dan. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Helen. Uh, Alex, let's, uh, let, <clears throat> let's close on one question, which I didn't ask you, I have here, but we can, uh, I think it's a good way to wrap up and because you, you mentioned a hard one, sorry, 
Is it a hard one? No, no. This, well, yes. Actually, this is a very hard question <clears throat> because you mentioned tourism. So it is, if you had a chance to show someone spe uh, something special about Israel, what would it be? It's a very hard one. I think it's the hardest one. Um, I love the desert. I come from uh, the Soviet Union, but I love the desert. The Israeli desert, the Negev, um, the, the Judean desert, that's my favorite spot. Uh, I used to wake up very early in the morning, go to the Machne Yehuda market, just before it opened, but the bakeries were open. I would buy bread, pitot, at, uh, at the bakeries of the Machne Yehuda market, pick up my friend, and we would go down to the Judean desert in, uh, in the winter. And we would go into these uh, hot pools, human-sized hot pools, which were just laid next to the to the uh, Dead Sea. Uh, you need to you need you need to know the place to find it. Um, but yes, that's probably my favorite place. Okay, we're taking notes. I Deputy Consul recommend. Deputy Consul General Gadler, on behalf of B'nai B'rith International, the Aachen Gate City Lodge, and Jews across the United States, thank you for your service and thank you for joining us today. Keep up the tremendous work. Thank you so much. I want to thank Mr. Mariushan and thank you, Deputy Consul General Gondler, for all your insights. And thank you for joining today's conversation called Dealing with Historic Changes and Challenges in the Middle East. Daniel, well, Helen, thank you so much. I also want to thank Mr. Harry Lutz, who's been a member for many years, and he is a past president who invited the Consul General. The Aachen Gate City Lodge has been thrilled to host this program, along with B'nai B'rith International, and we've been a proud sponsor of B'nai B'rith, Israel, and the Jewish people in the community, and the Lodge for 150 years. We've had a lot of opportunities for individuals and other organizations to work with and be involved with all of our efforts and look forward to seeing all of you in our future virtual programs. Please look for information about us on the Atlanta Jewish Connector and B'nai B'rith's website, B'nai I would like to also share with everyone that the Recording of this conversation will be available on demand on the B'nai B'rith International YouTube channel shortly. And once again, I want to thank all of you for joining us, and I hope you will come back for future discussions. Until then, please take care and continue to be well. <laughs>